Let's kick it off quickly, just for you to see what's on the agenda today. Of course, as always, a lot has happened in the last four weeks. Crypto never sleeps. There's always something going on. And the title for this analyst call will be The Tides Are Turning. Because obviously, we have to take a look at the latest regulatory developments. Then we also want to talk about Bitcoin's institutional adoption and some updates regarding Bitcoin. Then obviously some major changes when it comes to the ETF, ETN landscape. We had several approvals. We're going to talk about this. And last but not least, we'll dwell deeper into what's happening with Chainlink at the moment. Just to start off, a lot has happened when it comes to regulations in crypto especially in the US. Uh, there's a lot of back and uh, forth and 180s at the moment. And Lena, maybe you can give us a, a quick recap of what's happening in the markets. Thanks, Adrian. Yes, we are seeing a major shift in terms of policymaker sentiment, especially in Congress. As we approach elections, we know we have the first uh, presidential debate scheduled for June 27th. Until then, we expect a lot of talk, a lot of chatter, a lot of conversations on that regard, just using crypto as a bargaining chip or more of a political leverage to attract voters. So the facts are there are two brewing bills. There are more than that, but there are two main brewing bills that happened over the past weeks, two weeks. So the first one is the overturning of the staff accounting bulletin, so 121st staff accounting bulletin of the SEC. Congress re didn't really like it. So what is the SAB 121? SAB 121 basically enforces or requires financial institutions that hold or custody crypto on behalf of their clients to basically mirror these crypto assets on their balance sheets. Of course, that would have planted a big capital uh, pressure on these financial institutions. It would make it more difficult for financial institutions to hold crypto. So, and Congress also believes so. So they wrote a bill to overturn this bulletin and it has passed through the Senate. Biden actually over the past uh, month, White House voiced that they will veto it because it would be adversary for the SEC's jurisdiction and for investor protection and all that. But so far, they haven't announced their veto and they have until June 3rd to veto. And if they don't, and if Congress is in session, this will be ratified into law. This is essentially really good news for not only banks or financial institutions who want to hold crypto on behalf of their clients, but this is also solves a main concern for Congress because they believe that it would diversify crypto custodians who so far account for only four crypto custodians servicing the 11 Bitcoin ETFs. And it would also, of course, serve investors who want to hold crypto in a more traditional framework. So that's for the first bulletin that is that has passed through the Senate and is just waiting for Biden to just have a say at it. The second one, and it's, this is more exciting, if I may say, is the financial innovation and technology for the 21st century or FIT21. So FIT21 mainly has two things. It clarifies the longly debated distinction between the jurisdictions of the CFTC and the SEC. And it also has a decentralization test, so a, basically a test for decentralized systems that has five conditions that cover code. It has to be open source. The, the decentralized protocol has to be open sourced. It can't have a single person that controls it. It doesn't. It can, it can't have a single uh, person that accounts for more than twenty percent uh, or holds more twenty percent of the digital asset. And so and all that. So um, this really, it's, this is still pending Senate's approval, although it has uh, achieved bipartisan uh, support, uh, but it's still pending Senate and it's likely not going to pass through the Senate or that's or so analysts assume. But we think it's important. It's still important because it 
Uh, it's the first time for decentralization to enter the conversation or enter the conversation in this context. It will encourage protocols or blockchains to prioritize decentralization rather than disregard it to cater for regulations. So this is a very exciting. We should see more progress maybe next few months. But the, a more critical bill could resurface and actually has more chance to resurface since it has been in the talks since 2022. It's the Clarity for Payment Stablecoins Act. It was deemed a, a zombie bill or one of the zombie bills, keep your coins and all that. It may resurface as we approach the, the November elections, but we will see what, what happens. But it is an exciting time for regulations for sure. No, it's quite fascinating to see the U.S. finally moving forward. I also absolutely love the five-pronged decentralize, uh, decentralization test, uh, which kind of seems to replace the Howey test, which has been criticized because it's a pretty old concept that is applied to something that cutting edge uh, like digital assets. Does crypto become more political in the U.S. at the moment? Maybe, Alex, you want to you have a few words here? I, th I think it does. Actually, when you looking at the campaign at the moment, it actually seems to be actually having an impact on the campaign, on the way people are voting and the way people are thinking. Who would have thought, because crypto versus traditional finance is still quite a small portion of the financial service market, but it's actually getting, I think, punching above its weight. And it could become a, a much bigger election issue, I think, heading into November. I totally agree. I think it's going to be an exciting election, actually, yeah. to watch. But uh, it clearly shows that crypto might be an essential part for each party to win this election in the end. Maybe let's have a quick look at what's happening in Bitcoin. We talked about those news in our newsletter recently as well. As you might have seen, the 13F filings have been published in the US and it's our very first good indication of some of the institutional adoption over the last couple of months. And yeah, Max, what do you think? How are we looking so far in terms of adoption? I think May was... Uh... A great month to get insight into the institutional adoption of Bitcoin. As you just mentioned, the S1 filings uh, concluded last Wednesday, uh, which was the deadline for investment managers to disclose their U.S. equity holdings, which in this case would now include the U.S. Bitcoin ETFs. So just a great stat, I think, is the fact that 900 30 professional firms have invested in the U.S. spot Bitcoin ETFs as of March 31st, which is absolutely massive. To just compare this to the gold ETFs, which had 95 professional firms invested, can really show you the excitement that is that Bitcoin is garnering. As we know, gold ETFs were revolutionary in the sense that they provided access to the most demanded physical commodity, but Bitcoin has clearly overshadowed this. For instance, 11 billion of exposure is held by the end of Q1 in these Bitcoin ETFs by these institutions, which represents just about 18% of the Bitcoin ETFs total assets under management, which is a significant amount, but shows that these institutions could still end up purchasing more and more over months to come. Just to name a few, I think, which would be quite interesting for people to know is the likes of Millennium Management have come out as the biggest holder of these Bitcoin ETFs, investing almost two billion, with Susquehanna, for instance, following at 1.1 billion. What I think is quite interesting to see, though, is we even saw banks like Morgan Stanley buy in, and we even saw Bitcoin's best friend, Jamie Dimon's JP Morgan, invest 1.2 million. Even if it's a mere 1.2 million, I think it's a great step forward. I think, firstly, it's no surprise that the adoption levels are this large. These, these ETFs give accessibility through a regulated and traditional investment vehicle. However, these are the same or some of the same institutions that were calling Bitcoin a bubble just a few years ago. So we've really come a far way in this time. And it's also in the month that Bitcoin crossed a billion transactions. So there's a lot of reasons to be happy. And I think this just leads to more questions about where else could we see adoption? And I think actually in early May, we saw some hints at this. 
with some of the sovereign wealth funds doing their due diligence on Bitcoin ETFs as well. So for instance, we saw the no Norway's 1.6 trillion fund and Saudi Arabia's PIT doing some due diligence on potentially investing in Bitcoin as well, which is just great to see. No, absolutely. Especially, it, it's nice to see this list of hedge funds here. And we shouldn't forget those, the, all those companies on this list here, they in competition as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And it could even turn that not investing in, in crypto or not having an allocation uh, to bit could be careless almost because obviously they want to differentiate themselves in terms of performance. So definitely looking forward to the next 13F filings and what's going to happen in the future. I think just another point to quickly add here, the fact that we saw the medical device maker, uh, similar scientific, they came out, I think it was yesterday or the day before making an announcement that they are essentially using Bitcoin as their reserve asset. That's pretty crucial. Now we're just, it's go, it's extending beyond the, the landscape of the financial industry. And it's wholesome because we have been saying this for years. So it is really satisfying to see that this narrative and the value proposition of Bitcoin is really becoming more prominent. Even with Japan's meta planet, Japan, we know yeah. that the, their economy is really dealing with a lot of issues at the moment. So the fact that MetaPlanet is using it as a hedge against their currency debasement, again, it's starting to really extend beyond being just a, a tool for being competitive, as you've just mentioned, Adrian, but also we're seeing it yeah. for the true value proposition that it stands for. 100%. So in the audience, if you have any sovereign funds or any treasury managers, uh, make sure to educate yourself about Bitcoin. It's going to be uh, more and more important in the future. I'd also just add, I, I think it's a massive endorsement of the ETF vehicle. Obviously, there are different ways to access the space and building on what Kareem said, what Max says, having actually been through the 900 names now, it's quite striking how many of those names are from the traditional space and the amount of adoption. But I think it also speaks volumes for the way that investors are embracing ETFs as a vehicle to get access to, to, to Bitcoin. We might see more developments, I guess, in, in the US. I guess you'll come to that on Ethereum. Absolutely. Um, but I think it's a massive. We've seen ETFs grow in the traditional space so much over the last 15, 20 years. I think this is a very exciting next, next phase of development in the digital asset space. Now, let's just quickly take a look at the price for performance of Bitcoin over the last six months. Clearly see this rally from early this year after the Bitcoin ETFs have been approved and we saw massive inflows, we had this massive rally up. And until then, we've been consolidating between 60 and 70K, I would say. It's quite fascinating to me, like how people get so impatient when it comes to Bitcoin. Uh, people are addicted to the volatility, even though we truly believe some time of consolidation is actually really healthy for the market. As we can see now, Bitcoin basically is still struggling with the 70K resistance line. Um, we tried to break through uh, a couple days ago, but uh, we have been rejected uh, once more. However, overall, we're clearly in, still in an uptrend. And as of now, it just looks like it's a matter of time until we potentially break through 70 to 73 range. There's one uncertainty in the market or basically big news that creates some selling pressure. And maybe, Max, just tell us again what's happening and why we're failing to break the 70K. No, sounds good. So as you said, I do think there's a little bit of fear in the market at the moment. So just to rewind a little bit. There was recently, we actually saw observations that show that wallets linked to Mt. Gox which was once the largest Bitcoin exchange in the world, has transferred approximately 9 billion in assets to a single address. So why is this and, and, and what's the reason for this? Actually, Mt. Gox, which facilitated over 70% of all Bitcoin transactions, was hacked in 2014, losing around 750k in Bitcoin, though fortunately 200k was recovered. Recently, we got news in end of September 2023 that the creditor repayment deadline is set for October 21st, which there are efforts going on to be made to reimburse these creditors with around, I think, 142K Bitcoin, 143 Bitcoin 143K Bitcoin cash, and 69 billion yen. 
point being, though, we think that this recent observation of 9 billion assets being transferred away from Mt. Gox might be the first signs of creditors being repaid. Naturally, this brings a little bit of fear in the market, as obviously investors will be wondering if once creditors are reimbursed with their assets, if it could lead to potential sell-offs. I have my own interpretation of this, which I'd very kindly like to share. And I think that the creditors of Mt. Gox are actually very early adopters who believed in digital assets from the very first days. We're talking 2014. This is 10 years ago. I think these people, unless they have wildly changed their stance on the industry as a whole, will still be believing in the asset. And hence, I think that the sell-offs might really be milder than expected once the repayments really start to take place. So I think it's another challenge that Bitcoin has to face. And it will, in my opinion, survive it again with flying colors and hopefully continues its resilience in uh, weeks to come as well. I totally agree. I think we might see some short term selling pressure, but this is not really new news. We know about this for many months already. I do believe the market has priced in parts of it. Obviously, when news like this break, it creates some fear. And that's why mm. this could be a reason why we struggle to break through the 70K resistance. However, I think the silver lining here is that this removes another dark cloud in the crypto space. Once we're over this, we basically know, OK, this uncertainty is gone. Well, what you were about to mention, uh, Adrian, so this uh, table that you see in front of you, I think one of the main reasons why people were just spooked or caught a little bit off the guard is that there have been a lot of inflow transactions to all of these associated wallets. Uh, but this has not happened. Like the, the last transaction effectively happened about four and a half years ago. So suddenly we just saw that the accumulation of uh, about the 160 to 180,000 uh, worth of Bitcoin, they will all transferred in one go into this singular wallet. So I think people didn't really fully understand what was going on here. Was that all going to be liquidated uh, on the spot? What was happening exactly? I think there was a little bit of ambiguity here. Uh, but yeah, as, as we've shared, this has been no, as Adrian and Max have, have shared, has been known for a really long time. So I think it was just more so of demystifying the, the rationale of why all of this happened just in, in, in one go. Also here on the right side, you see a QR code. As you might know, we create a lot of Dune Analytics dashboards. And if you also want to track some of those real-time money flows, then you can see this on our empty Gox Bitcoin tracker. So that's where we got the information from. You basically can see in real time where the money is being transferred to. We still have to update it with the new address, but you should definitely take a look at it. I do think it'll be really exciting to see if the sell-offs are large or not, or if the 2014 hack really scared them for good. Exciting development. But now to the biggest news, and that's why we have our special guest here. The UK market opened. For those who don't know, Alex, he's our head of UK. His background is also more on the traditional side, but he's been a passionate crypto soldier for many years now, and his market finally opened. So Alex, what happened the last days? I see. I've got lots of gray hairs <laughs> to show for, for that for being that soldier. Yes, it was. Yesterday was a a milestone day, I would say, in terms of the, the crypto ETN market in the UK. I would temper a little bit, Adrian, because the yes, yesterday we did list on the London Stock Exchange. It's a milestone, it's a historic moment. We were the first issuer to be there. I would temper it though that these products have only been listed in the professional segment. And one of the questions that I have been asked a lot over the last few weeks about the opening of the UK market is, were we expecting to say, see the same kind of volume and interest as we saw in the US market? And I think it was pretty clear leading into this that we weren't. The reality is that professional investors in the UK have been able to use these products for a while, not on the LSA, they'd be able to trade them across Europe. But I think the fact that we now have products in the UK does show progress from the regulator. I think for many wealth firms in the UK, having that 
FCA, that's our regulator in the UK, having an FCA stamp of approval, having an LSE stamp of approval does make a difference. And I think it shows you the direction of travel in the UK. But I think they're also proving that they're committed to crypto. We're seeing stable coin regulation evolve in the UK. The FCA has also made a lot of noise around the commitment towards tokenization. This is an, another example. We're seeing more crypto companies opening up shop in the UK as well. So I am, I'm very bullish about the prospects for the UK market. I also think that within the next few years, the UK will be home to the largest crypto ETN market in Europe. So exciting days ahead for us. Absolutely. That's why I included a quote here from Ophelia, which basically described uh, the UK as one of the, the most liquid capital markets in the world. And I totally agree with you. We do believe the UK will become one of the biggest, if not the biggest crypto ecosystem in Europe. Um, On the 13F that you showed before, the biggest hedge fund holder of the Bitcoin products in the US was Millennium. I think Matt, Max mentioned that. Millenn Millennium is a UK hedge fund. I think it gives you an idea of the appetite here in the UK. And it wasn't just millenniums. I think it is an exciting time for crypto in the UK. Now, what do you think about the retail ban, just in terms of timeline? I think that we don't know. I think that's the bottom line. I think the, the FCA will be reviewing it um, over the next few months. I think that, that this is part of a phased approach where they want to open the market up in stages. They were very clear about that um, in the last few years as well. This ban on retail came into effect in 2020. Over the last 18 months or so, they have been saying they want to open it up in phases. I think this is part of that. They'll want to see, I think, over the next 12 months, how, how this market opening goes, making sure that it's an orderly market opening, making sure that people can buy and sell in an orderly manner. And I think if everything is smooth, then eventually they will lift the ban. And I think that the events that we are seeing in the US do also have an impact on the FCA. They obviously can see that the 11 issuers that launched in the US, the Bitcoin products, have now amassed, I think, more than $30 billion. Uh, my, my previous employer now has over $20 billion in, in their ETF. Obviously, we're seeing kind of the European market evolve. We're seeing things happening in Asia as well. So I think... When you put all this together, the FCA does have to pay attention. It's very difficult to put an exact timeline in it, but I would expect that over the next 18 months or so, they will review that retail ban. And there's more news. Obviously, the big news last week was around the Ethereum spot ETFs that have been approved in the US. And obviously, even over the pond, we continue to see institutional adoption and more regulatory clarity. Just to be concise here, the 19B4 filings have been approved on May 23rd. Those Ethereum ETFs said they are not trading yet. It still needs the approval of the S1 filings, which could take a couple of weeks or even months. But it's just a matter of time until we see Ethereum spot ETFs being traded in the US as well. I think what's really important here is that we can basically say Ethereum is a commodity because these ETFs are com commodity based trust shares, which basically means Ethereum is considered a commodity. I think the big difference here is or the big question mark still resolves around staking because those Ethereum spot ETFs, they don't include any staking. And it seems like the SEC might leave this door open because stake ETH could be potentially considered a security. And we've seen this with many of the, the SEC's wealth notices or law enforcements against staking providers, Kraken, Coinbase, and so on and so forth. Maybe Alex, because you do have some exposure to the US market as well, you know a lot of people. What's your opinion on the Ethereum spot ETFs and what can we expect in terms of flows? What do you think? Firstly, I think this news has taken the market by surprise. I think that the majority of people who had been working on this over the last few months, years, weren't expecting these products to be approved. So that, that's a surprise. I think that's probably why we saw the price action last week. But I think it also shows that the regulator is finally 
come round to a consensus view that they they have to let these in. And and so I think it's a very exciting moment for the US market. In terms of flows, it's difficult. It's difficult to know. I, I don't think it's going to have quite the amount of volume that we saw in the Bitcoin products. But clearly, you know, Ethereum is a very interesting part of the ecosystem. There's a lot of exciting things happening with Ethereum. And I think that there's a lot of interest in Ethereum as well. So I think the flows will come. I think for, for many of the traditional managers, they're still getting their head around Bitcoin. But I do think we're going to see money coming into these. And I think the direction of travel is clear, though. The big question I, I have is what's next, right? We're going to have Bitcoin. We're going to have ETH. What's the next coin that the SEC is going to allow into the market? Or, or, or will it now be a while before anything else happens? I would say either we have more regulatory clarity around how, for instance, something like Solana or Chainlink should be considered. I think that will bootstrap and speed up the process for us to see more spot ETFs in the US. Other than that, I truly believe, though, the futures market is an important track record for the regulators in the US just to assess and make sure there's not any market manipulation. And obviously, Bitcoin and Ethereum both had future products on the CME. They did have a track record under the supervision of the CFTC. And therefore, this kind of set them up for success to be listed as spot products as well. So I think that's something we should consider as well, which could drag something like a Solana ETF. Adrian, well, one, one um, comment on, on this is when you listen to the tokenization narrative, and obviously there's a lot in the UK, but also in the US, there's a lot of firms thinking about how they can create more tokenized solutions. We've already seen some of this happening. Some of, the, some of this is being done on the Ethereum blockchain as well. How much of a consideration or a factor is this as well when you think regulators are embracing the whole concept of tokenization? Maybe a question for the other. I, I do think it plays a huge role. If we exclude, so tokenization would, I think, would include two major sectors. It would include stable coins, which is the earliest form of tokenization. And then it covers more, more of the more recent innovations like tokenized US treasury, uh, private equity, real estate, and whatnot. So if we're just looking at the second half, which is the more modern version of tokenization, I would say, more than 80% of it is actually happening within the Ethereum ecosystem. So I do think that we're considering all the updates that we've seen with this emerging industry, it makes sense that you would need to start validating and legitimizing the underlying infrastructure, which is Ethereum, in order for these kind of products who are, in, in, in a lot of cases, are securities, to operate on this legitimized underlying ledger. So I, I do think that this actually plays a huge key role. BlackRock's tokenized money market fund, I think is the best example of this. They launched this about three, four months ago called Biddle. Uh, it has amassed more than close to half a billion dollars actually. And it's one of their most infamous products. So I really do think that this plays a, a role in influencing their changing stance about what, uh, yeah, how they view the crypto market and, and the railways of the crypto market. What about you, Lena and or Max, in terms of what could we expect in terms of flow? If you were to put a percentage, what, yeah. what do you think? So, yeah, I hate to be the party pooper here, but I do think that we will see slightly more muted flows for the Ethereum product than for what we saw with Bitcoin. I mean, at the end of April, on April 30th, we actually saw in Hong Kong two we saw the big uh, and Ethereum ETFs launch in tandem. And actually, they've amassed, I think, around 300 million in AUM as of now, uh, with 250 million of it coming from Bitcoin, actually. So it just shows that while Ethereum is a very exciting time to, to be interested and in investing in Ethereum ETFs, I think that we will see slightly more muted demand also because of the nature of Ethereum itself. I think Ethereum itself has a lot more utility as a token when holding it directly than Bitcoin does. I think you forego and you have a greater opportunity cost when holding Ethereum via an ETF than you would if you were to hold Bitcoin via an ETF. So I think this difference could play out here as well. That being said, I think investors in ETFs 
are not necessarily the same investors who would be investing directly into ETH. So it's still a lot to be seen, but I think the evidence from what we saw in Hong Kong could tell us that the Ethereum ETFs will have slightly lower demand. And especially on the point that you mentioned earlier with staking not being included as of now in the product. Yeah. Also, though, I do want to reiterate that I think the inclusion of no staking in the product is a benefit for direct crypto investors, as it would mean that there is less participants in staking, which would keep the staking yield at a healthy level still. Yeah, no, I think it's also an educational thing. So obviously, the whole narrative around a store of value is very easy to describe. So making the mm -hmm. investment case for Bitcoin, it's easy to understand people get it. I think when it comes to Ethereum, while I do think a lot of the, the people on Wall Street, they educated themselves, the majority of people still don't know the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin. And I think it will just take some time until they realize that those assets, especially within a portfolio, they shouldn't be cannibalizing each other. They actually perfectly complement each other. On one hand, you have the store of value, this hedge against currency debasement and geopolitical tension, while on the other side, you get exposure to more like a platform for innovation, really the base layer for Web3 innovation. And mm -hmm. until then, or in the long run especially, I do see success in this product, even though obviously the first boom won't be as big as the one from Bitcoin. Super exciting. Go ahead, Kareem. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, just to recap, in case any member of our audience is a bit hesitant or vague about what Ethereum is, or could sum it down to one single line, a liner, it's a globally unrestrictive and permissionless app store. That's really all what it is. It's the application storefront that allows anyone from any part of the world to develop applications, much like Bitcoin allows anyone disregarding of their location to send money. So it's the continuation of what Bitcoin started. But yeah, just to keep things simple for our, for our audience, in case you want yeah. to show this also to the larger circle of your financial. Yeah, and, and I think with that being said, it, it, this approval is a really big step as it highlights the value of Ethereum's on-chain ecosystem and the wide uh, range of applications that you mentioned, Kareem. And I think with the aforementioned uh, regulation of FIT21, we could really be heading to a future where more decentralized protocols start being integrated into the stock market, which is really exciting. Maybe let's quickly move on and just look at the, the price chart real quick. Ethereum really has been the unloved child over the last six months. It's clearly underperformed Bitcoin. Because obviously the spotlight has been on Bitcoin with all the geopolitical tension, with the ETF approval, while Ethereum was lagging behind. However, we did see this massive spike when we got the news that Ethereum ETFs will be approved. And Ethereum in terms of performance is catching up. It absolutely took a lot of people off guard. The ETF approval, in my opinion, were not priced in. And that's like why we see this reversal and hopefully also more attention to the second biggest asset in crypto. Alex, just uh, being in front of clients and everything, how do they perceive Ethereum? And what's your opinion, how the price might develop until the end of the year? I, th I think you've put it very well for a lot of traditional investors that they still focusing on the basics, still trying to get their head around Bitcoin and, and the basics of, of Ethereum. So I think education is absolutely key, but I think the more we, we're going back to the tokenization kind of narrative, like the more we see development around the tokenization, people start using Uniswap more, using some of the protocols on Ethereum. I think more people will, will start wanting to incorporate it into their portfolios as well. In, in terms of the price action, I agree with what Max said. I think we're not going to, and I, I said, it was, I don't think we're going to see the same kind of volume coming through to into ETH that we saw coming into Bitcoin. But I think it has a very kind of healthy future ahead of it. And I think it's a great time to get involved now. I think it is seen as the most exciting by many, as many who do follow crypto, is the most exciting kind of layer one out there. 
Absolutely. And again, it's just nice to see Ethereum doing three sets of 10% uh, and catching up with the price. Mm. Moving on to our last news and the baby child of the beloved topic of Kareem, but also Max. We had some major news around Chainlink. So maybe you want to just set the scene a little bit and tell us why those news were so big. Absolutely. Long story short, we've had the DTC, DTCC, which is the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, one of the largest post-trade financial organizations in the world. They were responsible, for instance, in 2023 for, or for processing three quadrillion dollar in securities. So they are effectively one of the largest corporations that is gluing and keeping the post-trade financial system together. So effectively, what they did was they have been collaborating with 10 of the largest institutions in the U.S., particularly, including JP, as you, as you can as we can see on the screen, JP Morgan, BNY, Mellon, Invesco, uh, Franklin and Templeton, pretty much like all, all amongst the 10 largest uh, TradFi institutions. And what they were trying to explore was effectively introducing a newer and a refined way of disseminating NAV data. As you can see from the screen in front of you, the current or the existing process, DTCC effectively takes or receives price and pricing data from different funds. They store it effectively in a database, if you may, and then interested parties would be able to query this data. But this is an extremely manual and a very, it's a labor intensive process that surprisingly includes a lot of Excel sheets, includes a lot of, just a lot of intermediaries and a lot of manual processes that really doesn't reflect the fast and the swift nature of the, of the current financial landscape. So effectively, what they were trying to do with Chainlink was, first of all, they were trying to create this, how would you say this, like a unified golden record where you are able to absorb all of this information from a bunch of different parties, include it in one smart contract. But then the key defining item of this process is that because we have so many blockchain networks and because we really do believe that the future will be uh, multi-chain, it's the ability for these institutions to, instead of building their infrastructure to be to onboard each and every one of those networks that has those tokenized assets, it would be able to use a streamlined sort of tool, which is CCIP. CCIP, just as a quick refresher, stands for cross-chain interoperability protocol. And just for simplistic purposes, it effectively means that you are able to seamlessly exchange data from one network to the other without you as a consumer needing to know uh, anything really about how to interact with this blockchain because institutions are not going to have the time and they're not going to have the technical capacity to keep developing new solutions for new emerging networks. They just need a streamlined way to be able to access this smart nav data in a seamless manner on the spot. And I have to argue that it is an outdated model. You can freely query for real-time data because the system doesn't allow for it. However, with the fact that you now have this golden unified layer of information and data and price feeds, you're able to access this on the spot. You're able to see this data being transmitted in a transparent manner. Of course, there is a certain degree of privacy uh, included in it, but you are able to distribute this data in a seamless manner. And this is really huge because at the end of the day, this is one of the key defining items for tokenization. If you are going to onboard uh, the, this wide array of digital assets, and of course, each jurisdiction might end up choosing their own network or preferring their own network, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for these institutions across the different jurisdictions to interact and build infrastructure that is unique to each and every one. So if we have the new SWIFT, if you may, that allows this information to be exchanged in quite a seamless manner, then we are headed in the right direction. And... Again, it echoes our theses at, at 21 shares because we really do believe that the future is multi-chain. The blockchain industry is the mother of all industries. There is not going to be a single network that services all the different sectors that you can think of, whether it's healthcare, whether it's the financial sector, whether it's insurance. So there's going to be a plurality of networks. And now the fact that we are able to see 
a more mature solution that allows the, dis the distribution of this data, again, in a seamless and in a secure manner, and also improves the rate of how this data is shared, it's a huge step forward for tokenization. And again, right now, the tokenization industry or the tokenized industry is worth about, if we exclude stable coins, as I was alluding to earlier today, it's worth about $4 billion, I would say, at most. However, we expect to the tokenization, this emerging industry, to reach $10 trillion by 2030. So this is huge. Uh, Chainlink, it's huge for the economics of Chainlink because, again, this is one of the solutions that has such a huge market opportunity. But it is also very crucial to onboard a lot of institutions, especially for the ones that haven't really appreciated the benefits of tokenization now. Now they can see the actual realistic vision of the fact that, that we are able to leverage the benefits of, of the LT systems in terms of faster settlement, in terms of efficiency, in terms of reduced costs, but not just because of blockchains, but also because of the, the solutions that will emerge on top of it that makes this a very seamless process. So yeah, big day for the tokenization industry, I would say. Absolutely. Yes. Sounds like it. If I could just, I think of you course. did a great job capturing everything, Kareem, and I'm happy that you got to talk about your baby. But I think I just <laughs> want to add one little thing. And it's while it's still early days, and this pilot just primarily focused on data dissemination, it could really be taken a, re a next step forward in future by, for instance, automating workflows uh, via blockchains, like triggering portfolio rebalances based on nav data which would be a huge move forward for tokenization as well. And just want to add one other thing that this project, while it's aimed at improving the state of tokenization going forward, it also benefits non-tokenized funds at the moment as well, just regular funds, because they can just get access to both historical and current NAV data through that real-time API that you mentioned. We do have a few questions, though, that I think we should, yes. we should tackle. Let me read out the questions real quick. And someone did raise their hands halfway through that I don't see on the list at the moment. So just to avoid mentioning names for G GDPR purposes, if you do want to lay out the question in the Q&A session or in the Q&A uh, pop-up window, please feel free to do so. Yeah. So the first question is for Alex, as a retail investor, when can I expect a segment to open for retail in the UK and what can I do now if I want to invest? I think we addressed the first part of the question, but maybe what can I do now if I want? My answer for that is whoever asked that, I think it's a great question. We've actually received a number of similar questions. What I would say to you is Get in touch with the FCA. I, I think it's it's very clear from our perspective, we are listed in a professional only segment. The retail ban is still in place. It is extremely difficult for retail investors to access crypto in the UK as things stand at the moment. If you are comfortable um, opening your own wallet and having your keys and passwords, then I guess that's one option for you. Um, but if you're a traditional investor trying to allocate a few percentage into Bitcoin or Ethereum, I think there's no better tool than the ET, ETN, ETF. You know, obviously, that's not possible at the moment for retail. The best thing you can do is get in touch with the FCA. I think the FCA needs to hear from retail investors who want to access the space. It's not something that we control, but I think the more feedback they hear from people that, you know, they would like to access it via an ETF, the more pressure there is on them, then the quicker this will happen. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm even happy to provide the FCA email address. <laughs> so feel free to reach out to Alex if you need some contact <laughs> information. He's happy to provide that. But yeah, I agree. I agree. We have two more questions. The first one is many banks in Germany do not allow trading of crypto ETCs and ETNs anymore. Is there a, an initiative to talk to the banks to change this? My 21 shares ETNs remain in the portfolio, but even saving plans are no longer executed. So first of all, thanks for choosing 21 shares. Uh, and regarding the question, to be really honest, yes, we do actively talk to all the banks to make sure uh, that no one has problems trading our products. So we want to make it as accessible and as easy for the end uh, clients to get exposure to to, to our products and to crypto. In some specific cases, 
especially here with Consorts Bank. To be honest, I don't know. I'm happy to get back to you. I would need to check with our head of Germany. I'm 100% sure he's aware of that and I can provide an update. But as of now, I'm, me personally, I wouldn't be answer, uh, able to answer. The last question we have, and I like this one a lot, will the Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs crowd out the interest in other currencies and therefore put off an altcoin rally? So basically, will this be a Bitcoin Ethereum dominant cycle and we won't have an altcoin season? Is, is that a scenario? Um, what do you guys think? I think this happens. Okay, this cycle, we've had the biggest splash for Bitcoin and Ethereum compared to previous cycles. There's no doubt about that. But this sort of line of thinking always emerges like each and every cycle because people think that all the activity and all the attention is diverted towards these two networks. So people will just lose attention and lose interest uh, in the others. But it's never, that's usually never the case. Especially again, because as I was saying, each and every network has its own compromises and it has its own unique design, which makes it suitable for certain applications. So for instance, if one of the decentralized social media applications, if they really become quite prominent in the next few months, this might potentially happen in one of the networks that is part of the Ethereum ecosystem. So for instance, we have a network called Base. Even though Base does not have its own token, if it did have its own token, people will be quite interested in seeing which platform does this application live on. Solana is another example. Solana, we're seeing Solana play such a crucial role now in payments. If Visa comes up, as Visa has already been experimenting with the network for quite some time now, if they launch a new, like a really all-encompassing and a comprehensive experiment on, on the network, or if we see things like, like how we saw Stripe now, enabling online payments via Solana. If we see one of those big splashes happen again, then I think people will just start paying attention towards these networks. So from a, from an inflows point of view, uh, I, th I do think that Ethereum and Bitcoin will have the majority because that's always what has been the case. But I don't think that this will ever be the, the turn off for the longer tail of assets. It's just, it, it, it doesn't make sense because the industry is so broad and so big that there are, there's so much happening across so many different ecosystems and so many different uh, blockchains. But I would actually imagine that, especially an Ethereum product would actually cause a rally in some of, some of the altcoins. I, I, I can mm -hmm. see people seeing it as an opportunity to invest in, in some of those altcoins. That's that has already happened, by the way. Yep. Uh, we have something called the ETH betas, which are effectively Ethereum, a leveraged Ethereum that things like Arbitrum, things like Optimism, um, other innovations like liquid staking solutions like Lido Finance, which is the biggest uh, by the virtue of the AUM that the application has. They have all outperformed Ethereum actually over the past two weeks, where since the chatter about the ETF approval started emerging. Bitcoin and Ethereum are the father and the mother of the industry. They will always have their respect and they will always have their place, but they will never divert and take people's attention away from the longer and ever growing ecosystem, I would say. I, I think so too. I, There's this narrative around capital rotation, basically. It starts with Bitcoin and ETH, then it flows to the long tail crypto assets. And a lot of people are concerned now if they invest via an ETF or an ETN, it's hard for them to do this capital rotation. What we got to remember, all those altcoin seasons are usually retail driven. They're yes. usually driven by people that are into the space, that are into crypto, um, and they are the ones creating the altcoin season. Um, obviously, we won't see any major institutional adoption when it comes to the long tail, but retail will eventually come back um, and it will create an altcoin season, in my opinion. And just yeah. on this point, uh, I, I know we've gone over time, but uh, <laughs> believe it or not, retail has not actually come back so far in this cycle. Despite all the craziness that we have seen over the past six to seven months, there are a lot of on-chain indicators that confirms and echoes this. The fact, of course, not all the signals that we've seen in previous cycles would apply and would be applicable at this time around, 
but still some of the applications that you see on App Store, they're not now in the top five, like things like Coinbase. We've seen Phantom, like the Solana wallet, it's now in the top five financial applications in the US, but this is really an outlier. We haven't seen, uh, of course, we've seen meme coins, uh, meme coins like dominate the market for the past several months. But that's also because meme coins are now becoming a much more entrenched part of the ecosystem because of a lot of different reasons that we could have an entire analyst call on. But all that the point being taken here is that we really haven't seen retail come back. And retail, at the end of the day, you really have to remember that retail is driven by the kind of legitimacy that the, that the market is absorbing and experiencing. And there is not a bigger stamp of approval than what we've seen with the approval of the Bitcoin ETF. And now with the subsequent approval of Ethereum and effectively giving credibility to the larger segment or the broader segment uh, of the market. No one has reached out to me on Facebook on people from high school asking me if I work for Bitcoin and if it's still a good if it's still a good time to invest into this weird coin he heard about from his neighbor, which currently <laughs> is rank uh, nine thousand five hundred eighty on coin market cap. So yeah, retail. The hype is not here yet, which is definitely comforting. I'm sorry, Max, you wanted to add something as well? No, I think Kareem put it perfectly. I just really wanted to reiterate that I think investors looking at these Bitcoin and ETF, uh, ETFs are likely a different customer segment than the ones looking into purchasing altcoins. So I think Kareem gave a really good response uh, to that. Awesome. In that case, we're five minutes late, but it was a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kareem, Lena, Max, and also thanks to you, Alex, for taking the time. I know you're very busy on your side, so we appreciate uh, you being part of the analyst call this week. I, I love spending time with you guys. I, I think you guys, in, in, in many ways, you guys are the secret source of the company and always learning stuff from you. So thank you for inviting me. All right. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, guys, and see you next time. Bye-bye.